Okay. Hello and welcome, and thank you for joining us today. The backdrop uh, to today's event is the Department for Transport's decision to allocate £250 million to local authorities to cement cycling and walking habits and to promote cycling as a replacement for journeys previously made by public transport. To get the most out of this and to ensure that the right interventions and investments are made, the collection and intelligent use of robust cycling data will be critical. As the saying goes, you can't manage what you don't measure. Before I introduce our panelists uh, today, I uh, hope you'll indulge me with just a few words about uh, our organization and our interest in this topic. Uh, my name is Jill Warren. I'm the co-chief executive of the European Cyclists Federation based in Brussels. The European Cyclists Federation is the European umbrella body of civil society organizations that advocate for more and better cycling throughout Europe. We represent the cycling user perspective. We promote cycling as a sustainable and healthy means of transport and leisure, and we lobby for the policies and investments that make more, safer, and better cycling possible for people of all ages and abilities. The collection and use of good cycling data is a topic that's very close to our hearts uh, at ECF. As cycling advocates, we know that good cycling data is extremely useful for making the case for more and better cycling. We apply an evidence-based approach to our advocacy, and the evidence provided by robust data helps show us um, and helps uh, show policymakers what's needed and why and what works. So informed policymaking is more likely to be good policymaking. I uh, hope you'll agree. So we will continue to promote more and better collection and availability of data on cycling. And this also includes leading and participating in pilot projects on data collection and collaborating with all kinds of stakeholders uh, in relevant working groups. For all sorts of reasons, um, good robust cycling data historically has been um, not very easy to come by, um, but there's some great new solutions out there today for collecting data, and more and more cities and councils are taking advantage of them. And we're gonna hear about some of that today from our expert panel. Uh, we're going to hear about how cycling data from new sources can inform infrastructure and cycle network planning, how it can be used to understand the risks that cyclists face and enable planners to design better solutions, how we can understand the number and the type of cyclists under a range of conditions and their preferred routes at different times, and how to create a feedback loop for information uh, on emerging cycling policy. And now I'll introduce our expert panelists uh, that we're here for today. So first up, we'll have Irene McAleese and Phil McAleese, the co-founders of CSense. Um, C-Sense uh, creates award-winning bike lights, which gives cyclists uh, more visibility on their ride and gives cities more information on their roads. And they work uh, closely with cities and organizations to help them use these insights. We'll also hear from Sam Lee, Senior Innovation Officer for Transport Strategy at Transport for Greater Manchester. He's got experience in the development and implementation of innovative transportation technologies, and he currently serves as for thematic lead on the City Burbs Smart Cities Demonstrator Project uh, for Greater Manchester. We'll also hear from Mark Hodgson, the Managing Director of CoBikes in Exeter. CoBikes is the first on-street citywide shared electric bike network in the UK. And Mark's got an impressive track record in helping and running innovative, sustainable businesses uh, in the mobility sector. We'll also hear from Laurent Genoc, the Export Manager from EcoCounter, EcoCounter offers data-driven solutions for encouraging bike and pedestrian activity, and they're a leader in uh, pedestrian and bicycle flow uh, monitoring. We'll also hear from Shrida Rahman, uh, who's a data scientist with the Oxfordshire City Council. Um, he is a PhD researcher at the Oxford Brookes University, focusing on sustainable mobility, transportation, and modeling, and he works in collaboration uh, with the City Council on various data sharing projects. Um, so now I'm going to turn over to Phil and Irene to um, talk about CSENS and, and what they're doing. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, yes, so hi everyone, it's Irene McAleese here. Um, I'll just check that my slides are moving. OK, 
Okay. Do I have control of, oh yeah, I do, great. Just checking I have control of the slides. So uh, as Jill mentioned, um, really the, the impetus for this call really is the, um, the UK's emergency, emergency travel fund is representing the largest ever um, sort of commitment to active travel um, in the UK with 250 million also allocated um, for emergency interventions. Um, so what something we want to sort of look at today is, is how um, local authorities are responding to that, um, obviously with the development of um, temporary infrastructure, but also about embedding and locking in um, that change to reap the environmental and health benefits. My camera on there, yeah. Um, so one of the things is key amongst this um, is oh, my slides are jumping. Um, it's not really just about you know establishing the um, emergency response um, lanes, which is actually critical to getting more people moving through a city, but also thinking about um, how we embed that behaviour change going forward um, to sustain cycling um, as you know to sustain the growth that we have. A key to that is going to be the safety of cyclists um, as well as the attractiveness and comfort um, of the routes um, that are developed. So key to that is is data. Um, as we said, not only for the, the bids for funding which are made, but also then the monitoring and evaluation of schemes um, that are put in place. So um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about CSENSE and, and how we're working with cities to help in this regard. So CSENSE, we're a cycling technology and data company based in Northern Ireland. Um, we make cycling tech products that make cycling safer and engage our community to share powerful data insights uh, to help improve conditions for cycling. Um, we're actually members of Cycling Industries Europe and we participate in their Connected um, Cycling and ITS Expert Forum. And we've won a number of awards here in the UK as well um, with recognition from the likes of Digital Catapult um, and Landor Link's own uh, Transport Technology Award for, for safety. Um, to give us recognition for the innovation that we're bringing to this space. So the technology that we have um, is connected and intelligent bike lights, a new um, bike tracking device launching soon. Um, I don't have time to go into the depths of these today, but suffice to say that they are all, um, they all contain embedded sensor technology with the use of AI to profile the rider and give um, experience, give an experiential view of um, the, the, the type of uh, te telemetry and experience of the cyclists as they're riding. We're also moving into bike share integration as well. And Mark, Mark from Cotars will touch a little bit on that today. Um, as well, we're looking at uh, e-cargo bike uh, integration. So using our products, you can unlock one of well, we would argue one of the most comprehensive uh, cycling data sets available. Um, so not only being able to look at things like popular routes and speed and dwell times, but also using our sensor technology, unlock insights on things like road roughness, collisions, braking patterns, swerving, um, origin destination, and also profile data. Um, we also have some amazing free data, which we've been able to launch very quickly now in response to the COVID-19 situation. So using our app, cyclists can report on any of these categories um, to do with close paths and collisions or potholes they might have experienced on their ride, but also where they would like to request um, infrastructure as well um, to add more width or separation from motor traffic. Um, these, these reports were just launched in the last week. We're, we've had a significant number of reports already coming in and these are visible on our website. Um, and um, if, any of the, if any of the local authorities or councils on this call today are interested in accessing that data, get in touch with us and we make that available for you for free. Um, so what we'll see today is really there's no one silver bullet, you know, for data collection that answers everything, but there is, um, you know, there are ways to combine data sets um, to really start to yield um, powerful insights um, together. Um, I'm going to sort of focus more on some of the data that we collect. This is um, a snapshot to show you how quickly we can scale. So this is data from 200 cyclists in six weeks um, in London. 
So it shows how quickly the, the data coverage can build. Um, and using the data, we can look at things obviously like the speed and the, the flow and directions of cyclists. Um, here at number one, you can see this is um, where there's some cycle infrastructure installed and, and cyclists are traveling um, faster in that area. Um, this is an example from Antwerp actually, where they were interested in not only the speed, but being able to understand how that differed with e-bike usage. Um, so this is something else that we can do with our data because we do collect um, aggregate um, profile information. Um, and it is interesting to start to unpack that, looking at things like whether they're on e-bike, um, their gender and age as well. Um, road surface roughness is quite unique to CSENSE. Um, we found a very high correlation um, with the data that we collect and the visual inspection on the road. Um, and increasingly, this is really important going forwards for, for maintenance um, of the paths that are built. Um, to ensure that you maintain not only safety but also comfort uh, for people on the networks. We did do um, a collaboration with ACOM actually in Dublin to use this road surface roughness data combined with um, the speed and junction analysis of dwell times um, to look at how that could inform things like a level of service analysis. Um, I mentioned as well swerving and, and braking. So this is a nice example in, in London again, where we can see um, the two bridges, the Southwark Bridge and the, the London Bridge. The, the bridge on the left um, actually has some dedicated um, cycle um, lanes here where we can see this has resulted with less swerving um, compared to the other bridge. And this is an example actually from Manchester um, where with some analysis work that Arup did using our data, um, looking at um, junctions that had recorded collisions from, from STATS-19 and trying to understand um, a little bit more about what might be contributing to those factors, looking at using the CSENSE swerving and braking data here you see on the right um, to really understand the experience of cyclists along that corridor. Um, which they tell us has, has actually resulted in some change to the designs um, they were, that were made on, as a result of that, looking at slowing, slowing traffic. Um, we do actually have a, another project underway at the moment in, in Birmingham, uh, working with um, ROSPA um, to also look at the, our collision data there and, and really trying to build predictive models um, out of that, which is quite exciting. Um, I mentioned before that we can disaggregate data down to profile level. Um, this is actually an example from Dublin uh, where we were, we had 45% um, women in the last project that we did. So we had some right, really nice data to, to explore. We found there that women um, were tending to, to experience rougher roads. Um, and um, we think this is because they're tending to, um, on some of the routes, ride or closer to the gutter because um, they're perhaps more fearful and staying out of wanting to stay away from traffic on roads that don't have good segregation. Um, so again, this is kind of evidence that can be very powerful to use to, um, to justify investment in infrastructure that's going to attract a wide range of people to use. The data insights we collect are actually all available on in a very easy to use uh, dashboard. Um, in this example here is actually from Dublin where we've brought in a layer of eco counter um, data. And Laurent is, will talk a little bit more about their great data later on, but it shows um, here the, 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 the uh, cylinder bars are showing where the eco counter points are and the orange is showing the popular routes from, from CSENSE, but down the left, you can bring in all of the other layers there as well. And on this, this example here, we can see um, all of these eco counterpoints, but then again, layered with the existing cycle infrastructure, which is in yellow and the existing parking points. Um, and this, these views can be tailored with organizations that we work with. Um, and all this information we think is uh, incredibly useful in, in monitoring and evaluation the experience for cyclists um, with infrastructure going forward to help build effective networks. 
Um, I don't have a lot of time, but I, it's a really quick whip through. Um, so I hope that's given you an overview of um, the feel of what we can do, but do feel free to reach out and I'm happy to take any questions at the end as well. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Irene. Is uh, Phil going to present something now or, or do no, we move he's, on to he's Sam? To, okay, um, Sam is up with questions. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, yes, and that's a very good prompt, uh, Irene. Um, everyone, please make sure to put any questions you have into the uh, question function. And after all speakers are presented, then we'll do some uh, Q&A. So thank you very much. Um, Sam, over to you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Sam Lee. I'm the Senior Innovation uh, Officer in Transport for Greater Manchester. So today, you know, the key question is, is data the crystal ball to the future of active travel? We all want to know what that future looks like. And we'll, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that we're working on at the moment, how, how it all brings together and kind of raises questions around the challenges we're facing uh, to see if any of the panelists or any of the other, other parties um, have solutions to. Um, next slide, please. Um, so how do we understand movement better? I think the way we've been looking at kind of monitoring evaluation is kind of broken down into two specific components. One component around on-site interventions and one component about on-vehicle interventions. We've been very lucky in Manchester that we've worked on a number of innovation projects ranging from synchronicity to city verb um, to, to really see the um, applications of CSENS to capture movement data and understanding how people move around the city in real time and help us identify key routes that traditionally we wouldn't have considered otherwise, uh, and really look at our infrastructure plan to see how it could needs to be shifted to, to, to accommodate for that. I bring up Mobike as well as a particular example. Uh, a lot of port people saw that as a major failing in Manchester, but we, as an authority, we learned a massive amount around data that could be collected from these um, cycle shared infrastructure uh, schemes and, and what, in, what interventions could be created from them and it, all, all of that is now feeding into our future thinking about active travel schemes as a whole. Um, there's various on-site um, monitoring evaluation technologies as well, such as Bluetooth and Wi-Fi sensor. Some of you may have seen them in the news around the contact tracing app that's failed, but we're, we're looking at kind of on-street devices to really understand how people move around. Um, Traditional devices such as loops and cycle counters that you'll hear more about from Lauren later down the line are also data sets we're using. Um, but the newer kind of uh, technologies that we're looking at are technologies such as computer vision to look at how people move around in real time and capture uh, data around um, not just purely vehicles, but cyclists, pedestrians, the, the complete modal mix uh, and kind of start understanding the movement and how it could potentially impact on design. Obviously, there's benefits and disadvantages on solutions, which I'll go into a bit more in, 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 in the presentation. Um, next slide, please. So how do we build this shorter feedback loop? I think the greatest, greatest challenge with a lot of the work we do is that civil infrastructure is designed to be built for 10, 20 years. <laughs> and it's very difficult a lot of the time to change a lot of that. So how do we incorporate this monitoring evaluation piece into the, a more iterative design? And I think now is a unique opportunity to, to, to start looking at that with pop-up and temporary schemes as well, and really managing kind of the safety components associated with these interventions as well. So once, but some of the challenges we're still experiencing is, is things like the traditional method still takes considerable amount of time and resource, you know, to, 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 to get that insight and not necessarily measuring the right thing at the moment, um, is really difficult actually to understand uh, at, a, at a volumetric level or, or the impact on the whole network. Sometimes we may have see, see impact on a specific scheme, but we don't necessarily know how that kind of cascade on the, on the wider basis as a whole. Um, and new methods to capture, uh, to, to use this data to change the scheme. What are the right interventions that we should be prioritizing as part of the monitoring evaluation? Is it things such as near misses, is it things um, such as, you know, speeding, for example, because, you know, cyclists has now got, got the cycling lane to themselves. So there's various considerations that we're starting to kind of come up with now in terms of that monitoring evaluation piece. And I think one of the kind of critical challenge a lot of the times as well, where we look at schemes potentially in isolation, and it's very difficult to determine what are the effectiveness of that independent measure in itself, considering so many other interventions are happening at the same time. And so it's, it's, it's the developing around that. And the final factors is 
you know, things such as social distancing are now a consideration for walking uh, and the potentially cycling perspective. How do we measure some of that uh, as, a, as a whole? Um, next slide, please. So one of the things we're, we're looking at in Transport for Greater Manchester is how can we bring all the different data sets together? I think historically we have been, uh, a, a, lot, a lot of different authorities have been looking at it from a very mo mo uh, monomodal basis, but really we should be looking, now is the opportunity to look at this multimodal demand management component, how different data sets you know, can be brought together to give you that complete picture of the city. You know, so should we be looking at data? Would we look at data sources just like mobile phone data? You know, what is it actually good enough for, and what insight could we generate from it? Wi-Fi sensors I touched on already, and bus and tram. You know, is there capacity data that we can get from those various vehicles and operators? What are the challenges around getting that data um, in, into the system to, to have that holistic wheel, uh, view? Contactless data. You know, we're so used to now being tapping in and tapping out for various things. We have the same for transport. What are the opportunities to link that data uh, into kind of active travel components? Uh, and your traditional ACON, ACON data, you know, that looks at that strategic view uh, as a whole. And as, as I mentioned, you know, contact tracing is a, is, a, is, a, is a thing that, you know, the central government's looking at. Is there a unique opportunity with some of that data set? Uh, that we can look at. But the, the fundamental question we need to start boiling down to is what are the levers that we can actually use um, from these this data insight that can inform and influence future travel behavior as a whole? Um, next slide, please. Um, but with a lot, and I think one of the things we need to really kind of deep down into is kind of how do we build trust with users? One of the big learning we had from the City Road project working with C-Sense is, is that is it, it's actually a unique opportunity to bring in more citizen-generated data to help the future. You know, how do we build that trust, trustworthiness of the data they provide? How do you make sure you know privacy considerations are taken into account in you know from a computer vision and CCTV perspective? Is there a real opportunity to demonstrate transparency on how we're using data to to help us plan and design future uh, infrastructure schemes and get more community engagement as a whole, you know, and, and really almost start using citizen as, 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 a, as a data source to help us build that future. Um, next slide, please. So here's some of the kind of questions that we've been thinking around uh, with, with the COVID crisis as, as a particular component, the whole mobility profile will change you know, so how do we really capture data on a lot of this? You know, now is the time really to, to explore different technologies and bring all that together to really understand what that looks like. You know, we st are we still assuming that the future wor work is still five days a week, you know, with a nine to five agenda? You, you know, what does the future retail look like now? People have had a taste of, uh, you know, on-demand delivery. Is there an opportunity to kind of make sure that we don't saturate our system and utilize things such as cargo bikes for, or, or get people to cycle to their local shops? And how is education going to be the same? You know, now we have, you know, kids that have remote learning uh, for a considering period of the time in the UK. And um, so it's, it's how we use that data to build more of a narrative and a story around it, because else it's not going to resonate and it's not really going to change people's perceptions and behavior as a whole. Uh, next slide, please. So I think one of the key things I kind of want to flag out, flag up is that a lot of these quantitative data capture using devices on site and on vehicles are great. I think there's some more difficult and nuanced data sets that really, really struggle to capture at the moment and whether or not there's ways of quantifying some of that. So things such as cycling confidence, you know, attitude to cycling, you know, real behavior change on how it links into the person's and family's lifestyles um, as a whole. And that, that cultural shift aspect of it, you know, we're, we're building all this infrastructure and, you know, there is some truth that if you build it, they will come. But how do we shape that narrative that it becomes the path of least resistance? You know, because uh, uh, us as human beings, we want to we want to go with the easiest path, the most convenient and fits our lifestyle, you know, the most. And I think one of the key components that we really need to start exploring is how do we build flexibility into our, our cycling infrastructure and active travel agenda as a whole? Um, so I hope that gives you a bit of insight in some of the work we're doing and some of the questions that we're exploring as well. Thanks. Okay. Sam, thank you very much for that really interesting presentation. Um, we're going to hear from Mark Hodgson now from CoBikes. Mark, over to you. 
Okay, hi. Uh, yeah, so Mark Hodgson. Um, so, um, I keep, the key thing I'd just stand back from the perspective, I guess, what our aim, we, we deliver shared mobility. So what we have an aim, and it's interesting what Sam was saying, to try and create that sort of greener, calmer, more connected places where people want to live and thrive, because transport inevitably in cities and towns, and that's where people live, act, and work. And as Sam said, it's about how do we change that infrastructure and actually both enable more shared mobility, but also change that planning perspective and horizon. Okay, um, we're, um, so co-cars, we're a cooperative. Um, we deliver on-demand mobility, so we deliver electric cars and electric bikes. Uh, that's what we're, we do as shared mobility, uh, really, really important. So I guess we're not just a bike, we look at mobility and therefore data is really important to us to understand how that all fits together. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so we are, we're based in the southwest. Um, we cover the southwest, and you can immediately see that we integrate with trains, both Southwest Rail and GWR. So we're already beginning to show that, that we already have various different data points in terms of transport, uh, buses, trains, cars, and bikes in our cities. So it's a really important perspective. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the other thing we don't just do bikes; we also do electric cargo bikes. And we also do vans. And we've seen, uh, we recently won a grant from DFT to put more electric cargo bikes in as well, both shared and delivery. So there's a real growth, and that is going to change the way uh, cities are moving. Next slide, please. Okay, so a bit more about our bikes. So we're, so we're a bike share. We're the first electric bike share in the country. We're now rolling out the largest electric dock scheme in the country with 100 electric bikes. We provide um, both docked and virtual docks. So we have a hybrid system as well, uh, really important. I guess a key thing, obviously from an electric bike perspective, we see much longer uh, use times, more longer mileage, average mileage than we would traditionally do on a bike share. We also see a much higher percentage of women uh, and attitude. And going back to the general theme, we're getting a lot more different use types and behaviors coming through because of what we offer. And so how do we maximize that? Because traditionally what's one of the big areas within cycling getting enough women and diversity through using, using our bikes. Okay, next slide, please. So this is a typical example of a hub. So we have a docked hub here. So the great thing about electric bikes, of course, is they're electric, which means they have onboard power, which can be used to provide and charge and to provide better data capability. And we also have charging points and stations, which also can be used for remote sensing, uh, what people are going around on that. And we've been trialing various different options both using out of the terminal and also then on the bikes. So this example, one is at the NHS, which, which has obviously been heavily used in Exeter. So next slide, please. So, and this just gives an example of the network we have here as we grow our network of bikes and cars, uh, slightly delayed because of COVID of course, um, but obviously we've seen an increasing usage of electric bikes. Um, we've never, we're very, very high usage and high demand from different both employers and providers uh, who are really interested in saying how can we grow the network, particularly in Exeter. Um, um, so, for example, we, we're putting more bikes at train stations with Southwest Rail, not just next but along the line. So we begin to see that there's quite a wide range. Obviously, one of the issues, of course, from our perspective is where do we put them? Where do we maximise demand? How is usage type going to change? Next slide, please. So I guess this come, breaks down from our perspective with a couple of key data requirements. So I think from our, obviously operationally, you know, where are the locations? Which are the most used locations? What are the use cases that people are using to? Uh, our bikes can go from A to B, where are they going? What are the distance? What's the site usage? And what are the time periods? We want to understand all of that. And these are all really valuable things to understand how we maximize the system. Safety, both in terms of customers and in bikes. Are they safe? Have they been damaged? Are the customers okay? How can we act actively report that? I guess another level um, in terms of developmental is where do we put the new docks? We can put virtual docks in where we can test a site. We can put um, a point, then see if that's really use. Does that fit very well with how general patterns, other movements going on around? How's that working maybe at a train station or particularly outside of business? And obviously then thinking about how do we develop route, route planning? And for us, because we're not in a major city, we're on the edge, we have a lot of commuting elements. How do we develop the edge of our network to attract more people to move into the commuting rather than driving in by car? 
Um, and I guess a real important point for us as well is about mobility hubs. Uh, so we already have our bikes, electric cars at train stations and uh, bus stops. So creating that mobility interchange and we're doing more of those. So how does the passenger flow change on that? Uh, uh, is, a, is a good point for us. Data and security is really important. Again, obviously, both of us obviously from a, a data feed and ease of access, but also, as we mentioned, consumer confidence. What are we doing with the data? How is it? How do we communicate that? Um, that's a much higher level. But also, how do we overlay? And I think one of the things that's really important is about investment justification. How does the data base include the sort of the place-based economics of a city? How does it change it? How can we influence that? How can we prove that what we're doing is actually inher inherently improving the capability of the city, both from a good livability city and from an, an economic value perspective city as well. And increasingly we get involved in new developments where we're putting sort of bikes and cars and cargo bikes in as a mean mobility solution. How can we prove that that is a real opportunity for them? Next slide, please. I guess that's where it comes to C-Sense. So one of the reasons, as Irene's already mentioned, is there's come key things that we're getting, we're going to get out. We're trialing uh, a trial with, with C-Sense, we're putting them into our bikes and also into our cars, and we're putting them into our cargo bikes as well. So it gives us really, really real-time accurate uh, locations, exact routes. I'm not going to list all of those, but it, that's, some of those things are really, really high value for us and obviously for the city themselves. It also then gives us much more understanding of what those sites are using and how the bike strips are using. And also, as there are temporary sites going in, but route plans through COVID and obviously uh, longer term cycling routes for super highways, we already have some in extern planning. How can we add value into that, those planning and decision making processes? Obviously, one of the key things about data is making it real and live and interesting to other people who are not so interested in data. Um, and I think that's really, really important to have dashboards. Um, but also we're, we're running a project with the university we're going to be linking this, this feed into other data sources, such as uh, with the Met Office, um, Mosaic, and other elements, and other travel providers that looks at how we can build a multi-layer approach to how, how changes are affecting many other things and what other aspects, both from a weather um, uh, perspective. And I guess ultimately, really, really interested in how we make that investment justification, both for ourselves, for the city, for a developer, from a carbon perspective. I think that's one of the, the big areas because I think there's a lot of interest in this area, but often the economics are not so clear. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, I just thought to say, I guess we're, we're growing and actually one of the things this is all leading us to is we currently got a, um, we're a cooperative, we're doing a share issue at the moment. And, and why have I said this? It's because we get a lot of interest. And I think what's been really interesting from our share issue perspective is as a community interest, I'm a community interest company, people can actually own the assets be part of it rather than be provided by a third party that they have no relationship with. And there is something really interesting from our perspective about trust. If you have trust in the company that you own part share of, that you are shared in, there's a lot more level of trust behavior and we get a lot of community feedback about opportunities and changes. Um, final slide, please. So there you go, there's my contact details if you want to talk to me further or find out more about the project we're working work with CSense, uh, get in touch. Okay. Mark, thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to uh, switch to Laurent in just a second. I'd just like to remind everybody of the possibility to submit questions for the Q&A session after our speakers have presented. We're getting some great questions so far, but uh, keep them coming. Thank you, Laurent, over to you. Thank you, Jill. So, hello to everyone. Uh, as my colleagues uh, explained, so we are collecting data and uh, they, they, they gave some good, very good reasons to, to do this. On, on our side at Echo Counter, this is the way we see a, a city, a living city. So, as you can see, uh, we, we don't have so many cars, maybe except some few uh, co-cars uh, running in the, in the city uh, from Mark. Yeah, and in order to to organize this this traffic, so we have to move the people in this city uh, to go to work, to go to school, and uh, we need to to collect data to do to better organize all these flows. So we've been collecting data on the car traffic uh, for years uh, to organize these and dimension the, the car lanes. And nowadays, it's more measuring the the 
the, traf the length of the traffic jams uh, with, for the car traffic. And so if we want to have sustainable uh, solutions, we probably have to move to the bike uh, uh, commuting, which is the best solution uh, to move people in a smart and easy and sustainable way. So now we, we start to see recommendations on, on layout uh, for the streets. Here is a, an example from uh, CEREMA. CEREMA is the major expertise center in France about uh, infrastructure and planning. So this is a, a recommendation that just uh, issued recently, uh, especially up after the, the post lockdown period. So I will come, come back to this uh, later on. So why collecting bike traffic data? Uh, first, because we can make nice graphs li like this, so it's very interesting. Uh, this one is taken from our EcoVisio software, uh, but uh, even more than the graph itself, uh, it's all the information we can get from, from this simple uh, analysis. So it shows uh, different, uh, how different the, the infrastructures uh, are used. Uh, here are three commuting routes, for instance, on the on the top. You can recognize uh, the, the the commuting pattern uh, with the, the peaks in the morning and in the evenings, and also a different uh, usage of one bicycle lane, the the street number two in black, which is more for for leisure. What information can we learn from this graph as well is the, the traffic volume. So here we have the hourly average, uh, the number of bikes per hour that are using the facilities. So it will help uh, to dimension uh, the infrastructure based on the, the amount of traffic. You can also compare uh, the different itineraries. So you, you see the, the, the upper uh, curve, which is showing probably a um, primary uh, infrastructure, while the, the others are a secondary network. And many different other information we can take, uh, take out from this, this graph. Uh, often I have the, the question when I visit some, some people, some clients, and they, they ask me, uh, when do I need to start my counting program? And my answer is always yesterday. Uh, the earlier you start, the sooner you get interesting figures. But it doesn't mean you have uh, you don't have immediate outputs. You don't need to to start your counting program and get only years of counting. You can get very interesting figures only after two weeks. Uh, for instance, uh, you can you can already capture the baseline bike and pedestrian volumes. After six months, you can justify your investment in new facilities. Uh, I heard this morning, by the way, on the on the radio when I was uh, coming to to work, uh, I heard uh, that the the French Minister of Transport, Elisabeth Borne, uh, said that they want to make permanent all the pop-up bike lanes implemented in France after the COVID. So these figures will help for sure to to confirm this decision by seeing the number of people that uh, use these um, these pop-up bike lanes. If you started in the, to, to count in the past, historical data will show the trend on the long term. It will allow to say, like here in, in, uh, in Paris, for instance, that the efforts uh, are paying regarding their bike policy with more bikes per hour in average. You see the interesting uh, increasing curve. And due to this long term, uh, uh, co data collection, it's also possible to measure the impact of exceptional events, like a sudden increase of 54% uh, in frequentation, like here, for instance. This is the impact of massive strikes in France uh, in December 2019 and January this year. There was no public transport, so biking was the best solution for the people to commute. The results have been Immediate, immediately taken by the press, by the politics and the cycling associations uh, to show that the, the bike was a, a very good solution to, to commute in the cities. So counting data, uh, counting bikes is very good for uh, communication purposes as well. More recently, we, we after the, uh, as I was mentioning, the post-lockdown era, 
uh, we we saw many pop-up bike lanes everywhere in the in the world, from Bogota to uh, to Berlin and even Paris. Here, uh, an example of one street, uh, the Boulevard Saint Michel. The picture has been taken from Google Street View in March 2020. So you, the, the painting was brand brand new, and the, the organization of the the street. Uh, the second picture, it's the same location at uh, the, the exactly the same place, but later on in uh, in May uh, this year, uh, after our installation team installed this easy to install counter in 30 minutes, they installed the, the two loops we you see below the bike uh, to monitor the traffic on these pop-up bike lanes. So this uh, infra new layout is a, a, a sudden change they, they put in place to allow the implementation of this bike lane it's dedicated and the bus traffic is now uh, separated uh, from from this and the result is uh, very enthusiastic because uh, the, the 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 this uh, specific uh, bike lane uh, is no no there is the most used bike lane in paris with more than 200 bikes per hour so this uh, type of measurement will help uh, definitely to make this new layout uh, to become permanent. Counting bikes on long term uh, also allows, uh, uh, as explained earlier, to know and estimate uh, a normal average bike traffic. This is what is represented uh, by the horizontal line uh, labeled 0%. This is the average uh, daily traffic we can expect in normal times. The three curves uh, that you can see on the screen are uh, the vari variation of bike uh, usage during uh, and after the lockdown in Spain, Italy, and France. We can clearly see that the bike traffic was lower than in normal conditions during the lockdown period, and which is normal as people stayed at home. It also shows that uh, bike is now more used than in the more than in the past, with the with the curves above the zero percent. This is due to the fact that many people are afraid to use public transportation because of risk of contamination. They reported their their commuting trips to to bike trips because it's a safer way to to keep the social distancing. So we can clearly see the increase of of bike usage compared to normal. We have the same information for uh, UK. The curve is a bit different because uh, probably due to a different management of the pandemic, but the results show anyway uh, an increase in the bike usage. You see uh, recently the, the bike usage is above the 0% uh, curve line, which means uh, bike is more used than previously. So we saw that uh, uh, we counting bikes uh, and even the same for pedestrian, the same applies, uh, give pertinent analysis of frequentation. Uh, starting from here, what is the next step? So we can uh, couple uh, GPS traces with permanent counters to get a better view and understanding of the bike network at, uh, at the level of, of a city or even larger. And this is what we started to, to work on with CSENS, as Irene already presented. They have very good information uh, with the, the, the bike lights and the, all the information they collect. Uh, they get the itineraries, the gender, very quali interesting qualitative information. So by combining the, the two data sets, we can get a very good picture of the bicycle network with qualitative and quantitative information. So here are some screenshots of what is possible to do by combining the two solutions. So you can get the volume of cyclists uh, per segment illustrated by colors and thickness of the lines. You can also get the, the same volume of cyclists but on the cycling network and then illustrate uh, the output uh, with what we call the desire lines uh, lots of cyclists without dedicated and safe bike infrastructure so for the bike planners this is the, where we will need to uh, prioritize the investment in new bike inf bike uh, infrastructure and of course many many more information as uh, Irene uh, already described so this is the the next step and 
this is where we will we will go so thank you for your attention and here is my contact if you want to to get in touch thanks very much Laurent uh, for that that's great um, just a reminder to our audience um, last chance uh, during the next presentation to ask your questions um, before we start the question and answer session um, following uh, Sridhar's presentation. So now over to, to Sridhar. Thanks, Jill. Um, hi, uh, so I'm Sridhar. I work at the Innovation Hub uh, in the dual role actually of both a software developer and a data scientist. Uh, so I'll be presenting today some of the work that we've been doing at the Innovation Hub, focusing on active travel and especially in cycling. Um, next slide, please. So a quick agenda of the presentation. So I will describe the baseline map that was a seed for this analysis. Um, then look at the different sources of cycling data that we have within Oxfordshire, only some of the data that we have been focusing on some of the data set. What is the current focus that we have due to the COVID-19 crisis and what will be the post-COVID-19 scenario and some preliminary analysis of the data that we've received from CSEN. Next slide, please. So the baseline is what we call as an uh, active travel explorer. Its primary purpose is to actually show heat maps of journey times across Oxfordshire based on focusing on active travel modes, and you can make comparisons. It's a tool which was mainly built for planners. It was built using open source libraries. The foundational data for it is GTFS, which is the common format for public transport schedules. The routing is a R5, which is a routing engine that is actually very optimal for a multimodal travel and with a lot of attention given to speed, uh, time, and efficient use of resources. And as I said, it's open source. So next slide, please. So just a quick snapshot. So this is a zoomed in image focusing on Oxford, and it shows the heat map of journey time from the point on the map that you can see. And it, the lighter colors are obviously places that can be reached quicker. But now if you want, but this is at 9 a.m. So if you just, for comparison, if you want to look at the same map for 3 a.m. Uh, next slide, please. So this is how it looks. And you can see that the map has shrunk, which is expected because accessibility is lesser. There aren't that many schedules at 3 a.m. as there were in the month as at 9 a.m. But what, in the especially in the post-COVID world, what if you want to compare buses with cycles? Um, next slide, please. So uh, green represents cycles, blue represents buses. You can clearly see that most places are much faster to reach by cycle. And there are some which are almost the same time. So this is, I mean, this obviously is slightly uh, an Oxford specific scenario and probably other cities in the UK as well. But this shows that you can, there is a, this is a good snapshot that can be used for the transport planning, especially when you're trying to build additional cycling infrastructure. But how about we try to look at bus versus walking? Uh, next slide, please. This also shows that there are a lot of regions around in the city center, especially which are faster or actually the same time, they take the same time to reach as by walk. So obviously for longer distances, it takes much longer. So then that's when we need to focus on cycling. So, which is why we have some, we're looking at some sources. So can we look at the next slide? Yeah, so these are the sources of cycling. So we have uh, CSENS and just to quick uh, give a quick uh, description of each of these. So they give G anonymized GPS locations and, and the additional metrics, which especially are important, we feel are accounts, speed, and road surface. And this data is something which we can probably um, stitch towards at a road level. We also have Vivacity Lab cameras. These are smart cameras who post-process camera images and um, they give us counts and speeds, but they're at an intersection level. And then another new source of data that just started getting is from Strava, which is an app which people download and use it's user data, but it's anonymized and post-processed. And this gives a good uh, indication of counts and speed levels at, at a road level, but again, it focuses more on cycling. Next slide, please. But so what is the current COVID-19 study on? So obviously the challenge is to identify future improvement in cycling infrastructure, as that would be the trend transition that we would want to do. And identify these changes in pre and post along some of these parameters using all the data sets that we have. It could be travel patterns, road quality, speed, volume of cyclists, and then use these findings, provide, take them back to the transport planners to help them prioritize the development. Next slide, please. And so as part of this presentation, I just want to show some quick analysis of CSEN's data that we've been doing. And we've, so we've just focusing more on Oxford here now, and we've identified a few corridors 
and try to see how this season's data relates to this both at a spatial level and an attribute level. Uh, next slide, please. So this shows in the pre and post phase that there have been some changes in some of the corridors, especially I think Cowley Road in terms of number of use, usage of cyclists. But as you can see, uh, Woodstock Road and Banbury Road, which are the northern parts of Oxford, uh, the, they, I mean, they are still the ones which are being used the most by cyclists. So again, this gives some kind of an idea. That, okay, we need to pro probe further in detail. So now can we go to the next slide, please? This get, breaks on all the metrics that we get from CSENS in the, and we're comparing it in the pre and post. And obviously the data points in cyclists are related because there are fewer cyclists on the road, which means there are fewer data points. But other, there seems to be a slight increase in speed, swerve surface and brake, but then, I mean, this just gives only a snapshot. It's only all that it tells us is we need to probe further in detail into each of these metrics, such as, uh, next slide, please. So this, we, we're trying to plot the road surface for the corridors and try to cluster them based on how uh, they may be with respect to certain quantiles. And based on this, maybe, I mean, I don't know whether it's as clear, but what we could see was that the Eastern section actually looks smoother in the post COVID scenario than the pre COVID, whereas the Northern section looks almost the same. So what this means is that this can be done for other parameters and we can look for trends. But then we can also take these findings and then go back and then you actually send people onto the streets to see how, what is the changes, reason for these changes or if they can, something can be done to fix this. So that's where we are right now. Um, next slide, please. For the next steps is, as I said, start collating all these findings, take them back to the county council, uh, planners especially. And also, as I spoke about other data sources that we have, we'll try to integrate that as well into making a more unified dashboard so that we have CSENS, Vivacity Labs, Strava, and any other data sets that we can get. Maybe if we can have some kind of an eco counter installed in Oxfordshire, so then we can start using those data sets as well. And then see how these future interventions can be monitored and start using them back for future analysis. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Sridhar. Can I ask all the panelists to turn their webcams on? so that we can move to the q a section and, and see see everyone great okay um we've had some great questions come in um it's, it's kind of hard to choose between them but um i would like to maybe start with a question for um laurent and any other panelists who, who would like to answer this one what do you think is the most effective way to swiftly motivate uh, City Hall to start investing in counters. <laughs> the law. Oh, Laurent, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself so we can hear you? Yep, sorry. Uh, here we go. Uh, I think we have many case studies uh, around the world to show and prove that the, the counting bicycles is very interesting. And all the uh, all the, the the communication we can make around this uh, and prove that bike is uh, very important is one thing that will help for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Irene and, and Phil, maybe maybe you'd like to also answer what um, you know what would your argumentation be, um, or what would be the best arguments to convince a city to invest in uh, collecting more cycling data. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think that one of the, the key points about having the data is that you can justify where, when you've made an investment, um, what, that there has been an impact um, from that, um, either in getting a greater volume of cyclists travelling on that route, or that you've ex improved the experience of cyclists by making it safer on a particular route. Um, and if you can show, if you can demonstrate with data that you've made that impact, um, that makes it a lot easier um, to create that political will, um, which is really important to then go forward and do more of that. Um, so, you know, political will is, um, you can't, be, can't underestimate, you know, data is one thing, but it can really help to drive that momentum to keep doing more of this. So um, I, I would say that it, it is worth the investment to, um, be able to monitor and evaluate, but to use that to do more of, and you know, even in the case of Mark uh, with with Cocars, look at how you expand schemes, how you do more with what you've what you've already started with. 
Mm -hmm. I think maybe okay. um, just to add to that, um, apologies, the, the number of webcams is limited to six, so you can't see me today. Um, okay. But I think one of the interesting things that I always find when we look at data in cities is, is uncovering the things that we never expected. It's, you know, finding the areas where, you know, we've discovered areas where, where perhaps, um, you know, during lunch hours, people are on their phones, perhaps not paying as much attention, and they won't hear bicycles coming as readily as they would hear a car or a bus. And so quite often they'll spill off a curl accidentally, not really paying attention, and you get a less than desirable interaction there between the cyclist and the pedestrian. And that sort of data is just incredibly difficult to find, you know, um, you can find anecdotal evidence, but it's pretty sketchy. Whereas when you start to deploy sensors around your cities, you get all these really interesting insights and I've never before seen insights that really help to paint uh, a much richer picture of what's happening in your city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jeff, kind of just jump in from an authority perspective from TFGM. I think a lot of the times there are so many ways of capturing data. As Irene said, what are the interventions? What are the levers we can pull with this data? You know, is it changing the way safety interventions are being implemented? You know, is it educational campaigns to measure that effectiveness? I think it, it comes back to what does the data lead to? You know, is it that you know we run a campaign? Is it is it and then measuring the success of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a slightly related question that that I find very interesting. Um, what data, as a city, let's say, um, or or municipality um, or council, what data can you use to justify cycling infrastructure spending in places where cycling levels are currently very low? Um, I don't know if Sridhar and Sam want to want to take on that one. <laughs> uh, I mean, so obviously, I mean, cycling levels aren't uh, technically low in Oxford, but it, I mean, obviously, there's always. I mean, you would want to keep increasing it. I mean, they're not say at Northern European level, so there is always uh, potential for improvement. I think uh, the way we would like to see is try to focus on reliability of uh, journey times and increase in volume of cyclists. So if we can show uh, data that uh, uh, buttresses both these arguments then we show that okay these interventions have actually worked so you have more cyclists on the road and you also have a, a more uh, faster commute time for them so I think yeah those would be the two points we would look at yeah I think it's a very difficult challenge it's almost a chicken and an egg question things you know if you don't build it they'll never come and then you build it you're never sure right as a whole i think some of the things that actually could start it to help us understand that cycling demand are things that rises of cycle schemes the cycle sharing schemes as a whole and actually that that's providing that access and the supply for people to utilize the network and to ensure those schemes are operated in a safe environment we want to invest in cycling infrastructure um and i think sometimes just bringing back to that a wider angle around decarbonization and the environment piece we need to move people away from cars and using kind of active travel modes or shared modes as a, as a particular kind of incentive so it's something that we need to do it's just working out how to spin that put that narrative together so that the citizen understands mm -hmm. yeah can Mark, i come Mark, in what there? would you say on that yeah yeah exactly i mean uh let's let's absolutely i mean we uh, i totally agree we've been definitely been we are there to actually help to drive demand. You know, we had a trial beforehand and absolutely we've seen a huge increase and we did a, a detailed study, both in some of the data we are already getting the bike, but then we did some really detailed uh, research with the university in terms of the type of customers. So I think we shouldn't just remember the trips. It's never like how many women, what their age groups, different types that wouldn't normally cycle that create different profiles, uh, both in terms of and justifying it, but also justifying it politically because you're being inclusive for the whole community. Um, you know, a lot of people just perceive of men cycling on Lycra and uh, and that still sits around an awful lot. Whereas if you can make this much more inclusive and it can be Mike like me in the community, I think that's really, really important. Uh, I think then well, what we've actually end, end up doing is doing films on getting different people cycling and then creating what it could look like is a really, really important point. So I think data, good data evidence based, backed with really good communication can really change that. And we know that then what we've done by proving their interest has enabled political will to enable more cycle routes to come in, super highways to come in as well. It's also, mm -hmm. I guess, because we do the car share, which obviously if you share a car, you sort of take seven to 10 cars off the road, that creates more space as well. 
And if people can, I guess that's why we focus on creating great spaces for people to live and thrive. Because if people can see that change beginning to happen, the political will is easier to understand. Ah, oh, right, okay, if we do this, this is what's happening. So it's not just seen as a cycling lobby, it's seen as a city change approach. And obviously COVID has created a real big opportunity for people to see maybe what it would be like. And then this has enabled people to say, well, wow, wow, what would it be like if we had less cars? Oh, we have less, more space, et cetera. But it's still gonna be evidence-based through data. And that's when you need to add in more and more uh, data change. And I guess the other thing I was gonna say, we shouldn't forget that transport is a function of economics. And uh, so we've got to remember that the city's very well looked at how the city performs economically, and that's quite right, and how people's lives are affected by that. So you can begin to build up economic justifications for why you can take spaces out and put bikes in, and that still creates a spend. So that's the that's the that's where you that's when you get the economic justifications really, really important. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we did get through the um, presentations, through the course of the presentations, several COVID-related questions. Um, I know that um, Laurent addressed this specifically um, in, in his presentation that came up in a, other, a couple of other contexts, but is there anything else people would like to mention in terms of the, the data that we collected during that period and how it could be used or, or any interesting insights uh, from it in relation to that in particular? Um, would anyone like to to weigh in on that? I think um, I, well, oh, I was going to say. Oh, I, I mean, I, I read first and then and then say. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the things that we obviously saw with our data, um, you know, prior to COVID, I mean, most of the data we have is around a lot of commuter rides that we would have. We could clearly see the journeys are happening sort of Monday to Friday, the peak periods of sort of the morning commute and the afternoon commute. And we really, really, really saw that drop away massively, obviously, through through lockdown. Um, but what was interesting in our data is that we could see where they they had continued riding, but just not in that in the same way. So people were riding on different routes for obviously uh, leisure and exercise routes. So there's different patterns starting to be seen. Um, some of them were riding um, actually longer journeys than they would normally have done on their daily commute. And um, some of the speeds were faster as well, actually, which is sort of interesting. But um, so, yeah, I mean, definitely we, we did see a sort of general a general trend of looking at where people are riding for leisure and, and those patterns changing, which is kind of interesting to see, um, you know, as Sam mentioned, um, our we may not go back to normal in the way what normal was before you know things are people may choose to start working from home more there could be different ways that people are using routes that they were not now using more local journeys perhaps around their homes and their communities than they may have done in the past so that's going to be something very interesting to to um, monitor and understand um, how that develops going forward mm -hmm. Sam. Yeah, I think I, I really stole my thunder a little bit there. Oh. Uh, <laughs> my points. Uh, but I think just one thing to add, uh, I think one of the things we need to start looking at is actually from a kind of a mobility persona perspective. I think personas has been looked at in, in different sense, but it's kind of one of the ways we can start really understanding who are the people that are most likely to change. Is it young families? Is it and, and how all that links into what the future high street looks like, Irene touched on people working remotely. Is there a wider opportunity for smaller towns now to have satellite offices that people can work out of, for example, that are commutable, right? Uh, and is what data do we need to collect to start building those future profiles of what mobility looks like for a city and then all the other interventions that go along with it. I think we need to not forget when people tend to use cars, it's not just for the commute, it's for things like dropping their kids off to school, you know, doing their grocery shopping. This is that wider lifestyle piece. So I think linking all the different data together to start really understanding that cultural requirement will be really interesting moving forward. Mm -hmm. I, I was just gonna say, we've seen uh, mm -hmm. new sites that have okay. gone in um, and actually they've, they've really grown. Um, <laughs> you know, because there's been the space. And actually then we've been adding more docks into new sites because they've been so busy. Uh, that's actually, and it's, re it's really interesting. And then also we've been 
offering um, free or, or discounted for key workers, so NHS and police, etc. And they've taken up and obviously then suddenly created that demand. And now we're now seeing that, uh, for example, uh, sites are now wanting more docks. And they've actually said there's a permanent change in behaviour going on there because of that space. Mm -hmm. And then the and then the and then the, the hospital and some other uh, businesses are saying actually we want more cycle lanes. So there's been a change, and they understand that infrastructure now needs to be locked in to enable that behaviour change to change as well. So mm -hmm. we've you know there's been a there's been really it's an awful lot of positives. And I guess the question is making sure that you lock in those change. So as much as the mm -hmm. data modelling is actually then saying can the infrastructure be locked in before too much revert back to the legacy but right. I, I totally with yeah. Sam that we've seen we've seen different changes both from a calm mobility perspective as well of people working from home and we've recently done a big survey with how people would want to be moving and using shared mobility uh, which has been really interesting yeah. absolutely okay um slightly different type of question um but I think also very relevant to, to this discussion how do you find financing for a project for data collection um, you know, would the municipality buy all of the, the sensors or the counters um, or do the bicyclists um, provide that through the apps? You know, how does that work? You know, some of you who've been involved in these projects. Uh, mm, I, I, I would say it's part, most, most of the time it's part of the, the municipality's budget. Uh, you, can, you can work with the cycling association, but the, the, they won't have the, the fund to, to buy the counting, implement the counting program so we need to work with the municipalities and it's most of the time part of the traffic so they have to manage the, the roads anyway so it's just changing replacing uh, the what was allocated to the car traffic to find a way to put this on the bike uh, bike traffic uh, instead and it's something that is very successful most of the time because even if you start to to take some money for the from the car uh, lobby, um, well, yeah, they will complain for uh, for sure. But uh, we have many examples where we we show the the because the the goal of the the traffic planners is to move people. As I was mentioning at the beginning of the presentation, they, they have to move people, not cars. So once we can make them accept this, uh, they can understand that they can move more people, especially in the city centers, with the bikes than with the cars. And so they are, uh, if they want to achieve their goal, which is moving people, they need to also take into consideration uh, the, the fact to, to, to change a bit their paradigm. Uh, instead of moving cars, they need to move people and bikes and pedestrians and also public transports, which is part of the... So this is uh, yeah, the way we work. And for, in, for instance, with uh, Paris municipality, which was not the best bike-friendly city in the world, uh, they changed their uh, attitude and so we were very successful because we have uh, Christoph Najdowski who is, who is doing a great job. He's my boss Paris. actually, he's the president exactly. of the <laughs> That's BCF, why I, yeah. I mentioned him. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, w once you have this kind of, uh, of person in, uh, in the municipality, it helps for sure. Mm -hmm. Good. Anybody else oh. want to weigh in on how to find financing for these kind of projects? Yeah, so with um, Oxfordshire County Council, so um, our team is slightly unique in the sense that so uh, majority of us are externally funded. So we we get funding from projects for buying these devices, uh, running them using the data analysis, and we try to use the data analysis portion to hitch onto other proposals. So through which again we can continue having these devices for a much longer lifetime. So we don't we don't look at a project and grab the devices but we hope to get something out of the data and then use them for other users and since as a team we get the data we share it with as many people as possible in the county council so that they have different use cases for it and it helps propagate uh, hopefully not self-sustaining but it's sustained itself through longer timelines than what it would have if it had just been a single short-term project. I suppose and, and having the, the data in the first place helps you with the bids for more funding right so um, exactly. because you're able to justify your bid and, and explain that you have a, a robust plan um, in place for how you want to develop your scheme so whenever you do um, make the pitch to DFT um, you've you've founded that on on something um, concrete um, and that that hopefully will help sustain it 
Yeah, just want to quickly add, I think there are so many different models to make this work. I think like the work Irene does actually engaging with personal cyclists and that data becomes, the, the, the smart light becomes their safety device, but the data actually helps the city kind of uh, design better. It's actually an, a different approach to it that doesn't put as much constraint on public authorities. I think a lot of people I think that public authorities have a lot of funds, but we're always stretched in terms of what we can do. And it's actually working out why the commercial use cases associated with some of this um, as a whole. So, you know, Irene's is sensor. One of the kind of areas we haven't really talk, talk, talked about is kind of future of freight, right? You know, is there things like new cargo buys that these sensors can go on and you know, new commercial models being developed around some of this uh, as, as a whole? It doesn't necessarily always have to be the public sector that pays the bill, because for it to be commercially sustainable, it needs to be the wider marketplace that pays for it. Yeah, and I guess that's where I'd come in and say that obviously from our perspective, we put them in and we would share the data as well, because it's in our interest, but also in the public authority interest. And actually, that's why I was keen to show that when we looked at our data, it, there's a benefit to the local authority, and there's a benefit to our customers, and there's a benefit to us. And that's why we're working with Ryan, I read, because that gives us that real detailed data and in fact as part of the DFT when we're actually putting uh, uh, about 30 more cargo bikes back into uh, Exeter all of those will have the tracking data on to see how they're used and some of those are used by us and some of those are going to be used by partners so um, like the university and uh, um, NHS and various other partners and that's partly why we put them in to give, create that evidence base as Sam, as Sam absolutely right he said so there's a mutual and I always think there's a very mutual benefit I know a lot of people just look to uh, the local authority to provide, and that isn't the correct. Uh, we've also been able to get some funding through a environmental data lab down here in the southwest, which has also given us the capability. It's, a, it's match funding, so we put some money into that to help develop as well. So I think at least if you get the two times right, there's a mutual benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we've got time for another question. Um, We've got a good question here. So there's a lot, been a lot of focus today on urban areas, understandably. Um, but uh, just in terms of places outside of key metropolitan areas with a mix of urban and rural settlements, how would you see the data collection working uh, for these areas in terms of attracting um, cycle commuting or increasing local uh, cycle use? Any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, o Oxfordshire County Council is it has a lot of rural areas, and I think one of the things that we've been sort of um, starting to think about is um, the use of e-bikes um, to help uh, help those, some of those longer journeys, and the use of mobility hubs as well um, to sort of really connect people um, better, and, and the use of e-bikes. So I think that. Um, Having data, um, you know, especially in, well, hopefully what will come out of the work with with Mark uh, in particular in, in Exeter with mobility hubs there, is to show how the how the data is being used um, from those e-bikes, because um, people can take longer journeys on on those bikes than they would do um, on a regular bike. So I think that's that is definitely something that will be interesting to explore with the data, um, and it will be about. Um, you know, those mobility hubs being key to making sure that those journeys can link up um, people from from those rural, more rural areas in, in into a network. That's that's my 2P, but feel free to, to jump in, anyone else, to add more. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I think even, even more than collecting when, if, if we want to promote this rural uh, commuting, uh, we also need to make com uh, good communication around the data. So collecting data is very nice, but we need to show this data. Uh, so either by a display on the on the route or uh, by putting the figures on the newspapers and really showing that uh, you have cyclists. And once you have cyclists, it will bring other cyclists to, to commute. So it's the, the magic effect of the of the cycling. Well, if you don't see anybody, you, you, won't, you won't probably uh, bike. But uh, if you start to implement a bike structure, you will have one bike, two bikes, and then it will drain more bikes. So it's all, all about communicating around the, around the figures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I okay. guess to use to use a to use a, uh, a term that um, 
or from a like gateway drug. We're definitely electric bikes, a shared electric bikes are also a gateway drug into people buying their own bikes, and electric bikes, we absolutely know that. And that's absolutely very much what we do with the local authority as well. Yes, but one of the reasons why I showed our map is Exeter is not a big city. You know, it's only 130,000 people, and it's in a very rural area, it's a peri-rural area. So we have people cycling over to Holden Hill, they cycle down to the, the, the sea, you know, they do 20, 30 miles. It isn't just city-based bike share and all of those are tracks. And two things, absolutely from Lauren's perspective, um, people seeing our bikes cycling out, get people interested both in trying our bikes and then getting a bike themselves, an electric bike, and that's great. And we know that definitely happens. But also then part of this is giving the rural data to highlight the need. And we're actually looking at doing this on the trial of a new trail that's wanting to go in around the edge of the city, which is outside the city. We want to put some bike share in there and then using the data to justify why that should be increased and given more priority and also be improved as a, as a capability of the route. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Just add from our local authority perspective. Sorry, Joe, if you want to move. No, no, <laughs> um, no, think, go ahead. Yeah, I think this is a really challenging one because it, it comes back to placemaking. It's not necessarily about the modes themselves. It's, it's around what does the future of your rural towns could potentially look like. And a lot of times when we look at cycling for commuting, is that the right approach to look at it, considering people own cars in rural areas, not necessarily for the commute, it's for getting to the shops, you know, getting their kids to school. So it, it, in some ways, that, that data needs to start informing kind of the gaps associated with it from a, from a and I agree with Irene, it's, it's, it's not just one mode that solves the whole problem, is how we use active travel, walking, cycling to link into rapid transit infrastructure, such as your buses, your trams, your metros, you know, to have that holistic access to different parts of the city city as a whole. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think with rural, it will evolve, just like how a city sprawl develops over time. And we've got to be mindful that, you know, we may be designing uh, a cycle system for a rural area, but that rural area, if the economy grows and the city grows, become an urban area over time. So how do we have those flexibility to adapt and change over time? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's been another, I find quite interesting question uh, in, the, in this whole debate. Um, what about weather factors? I mean, we saw that the spike uh, that Laurent showed, for example, on the, the days of a strike, and how um, cycle use, you know, massively increased on those two days. But what about bad weather, good weather? What are we seeing in the data on, on those kinds of days? Um, yeah, maybe I can just uh, yeah answer quickly on this one. So, for instance, on our software, which is called EcoVisio, we link the the weather data to the the count data. So we can really see the impact of the weather on the bike traffic, for instance, or the pedestrian traffic. Uh, it's really impressive when you have a biking, uh, biking period with some, some rain. And depending on when is uh, <laughs> happening the rain, uh, because if it's planned or not, the, the, then it has an impact on the bike uh, frequentation for sure. So it's very interesting to to compare the two, and so even even the the snow or whatever are the the hot conditions in the south. So it's you you definitely see the the difference. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what, what about uh, what about the sea sensors? What are, yeah, I mean, we would see. Um, I mean, the thing about rain is that it doesn't rain as many days as you think it might. Um, <laughs> You know, um, and I do like the saying uh, that they have um, in the Netherlands as it sort of translates to you're not made of sugar, you know, so you, even if you do get a bit wet, um, you're still going to survive. Um, and, and what we have seen in, in our data is um, you, you do get a slight drop off. You know, we look at seasonal, seasonality sort of trends over the years. Uh, you can get a slight drop off in the middle of winter. But um depending on the, the quality of the infrastructure and what's happening in the city, the drop-off may not be as much as you might think. And obviously we see in some of the, um, you know, uh, some of the countries in, in the cities like Copenhagen and, and Amsterdam, um, people cycle in all sorts of weather. So I think that um, weather has an influence, but it is not the main influence on whether people can cycle. And if the route makes sense um, and it's the fastest way to get there and it's convenient and it's culturally sort of accepted, then I think we will see more and more uh, of that happening. Yeah. Um, 
So, um, you know, we, we do see a slight drop off. Um, it, we have an interesting example in, in our Dublin data when a cyclone hit um, in Dublin and um, it was a few days before Christmas actually and and it completely plummeted like there was nobody on a bike in Dublin that day I mean it was a it was a major cyclone that hit the city fair enough uh, but very quickly comes up um, back up again straight afterwards so um, yeah I think I think weather trends are interesting to look at but I, I, I do feel optimistic that you know weather isn't the only determinant about whether people will be riding bikes the the infrastructure mm -hmm. and the culture has a lot more to do with it as well yeah I rode my bike home in the rain the other day so Very good. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I would I would like to give all of our panelists uh it did anyone else have something to say on weather first sorry before I, I was just gonna I was just gonna yeah. do you want to go sorry I was literally going to say, you've got to remember as well that we know that during the summer people will take their normal bike, but when it's harder weather or it's colder, they use our electric bikes, simply because there's more wind. So you've just got to remember, think about that personality, think about the customer data. It's not just straightforward bike bike, right. they're different types. So I think that's always a really important point. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make two points on the data side of things. I think weather is an interesting factor when you start looking at infrastructure and from a safety perspective, as Irene talks about, um, a lot of those technologies and kind of in the UK, road safety, we don't necessarily capture stuff around kind of bikes and near misses as much as, you know, vehicle collisions. So actually correlating weather to whether or not accidents occur happen more and understanding where the gaps are from an infrastructure improvement perspective are could be a really interesting thing to start expanding more on. I think the other key key point and kind of Mark touched on is around that flexibility side of things. I know and I know a lot of people that commute into the city and they see a weather report that is going to be torrential rain down for in the evening, just leave their bike in the office and get public transport home. It's having that flexibility to mix the different modes and being able to get around as a whole. So yeah, weather is is a cultural factor because you know based in Manchester, it rains here all the time, as Irene knows. <laughs> Well, it rains as much as Amsterdam, so why do we not have the same cycle uptake? <laughs> yeah, um, interesting point as well, something we see in Northern Ireland where we live with the snow. Uh, we get a lot more snow in winter and um, that can have quite a big impact on the road surface quality. Um, you know, so um, if you've had thawing and freezing, um, the condition of the road can quite rapidly change. So a road that was um, reasonably con good condition last week can have a, a massive impact if there's been a lot of water lying and, and those kind of conditions. So that is something that we can um, start to pick up with our data as well to show and maybe help the, the, the local authority highlight uh, where they want to prioritise some repairs um, as a result of of snow and, and water lying around and things like that that may have impacted the, the quality of the network. Mm -hmm. Great, okay, thanks very much. I, I would like to um, ask all of our panelists just for any final words they have, any points they, they didn't get to make or, or final thoughts they'd like to leave us with. Um, can I start with uh, uh, Sridhar? Just going from left to right on my screen. Yep, sure. Um, I, I mean, I think the i mean the biggest challenge at least for us in oxfordshire county council is we have a lot of data obviously cycling part of it is cycling but we have a lot of data also on say footpaths and trying to look at pedestrian access so so the different data the synthesis of this data into something which is easily accessible to transport planners i think that is the bigger challenge so we obviously we can keep getting devices and data sources but then Eventually, the way to actually make it meaningful, I think that is the biggest challenge, and that's probably something that our team is working on a lot. So I think that would be something which we would focus on. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Mark. Um, yeah. Okay. I guess I think it's the interrelationship with different modes. I think that's really, really important. The flexibility, how that fits together. You know, we increasingly move in different ways. It's going to, and how that's going to change. And that's so important if we do want to reduce car capability people do need to have flexibility bike share bus train their own bike and how do those interact and how do we maximize how does data enable that to be really easy both in terms of user experience to do it but also in a way of planning it that actually fits with the economy of the city or the town mm -hmm. great thanks very much uh irene and phil <laughs> 
I feel at this point I should let Philip um, maybe say something <laughs> because he hasn't had the chance in the video. Philip, would you like to add anything? Yeah, yeah no, of course. I think the, the probably the takeaway for me is that you know when you look at the, the big cycling cities like Amsterdam and Copenhagen, they've invested over decades in infrastructure um, and they've had you know really long-sighted plans. I think we live in a society now where the rate of change is more rapid and more phenomenal than ever. And so in order to make your planning and interventions effective, you need to be able to measure them. And really, um, you know, today is the data age and it's time to, you know, whether it's us or whether it's uh, any of the other sources out there of data, you know, grab them all, combine them um, and see what you can get for the best possible outcomes. And I'll just quickly do a last plug for anyone listening who wants to access the free data that we're making available um, through the CSENSE reports. Um, could be a nice starting point for you if you don't have um, data at the moment that you, you have. And it's a really nice way to engage your local community as well to have some input from the cyclists themselves who'll be using the infrastructure. Okay, good. Laurent? Yeah, I think the yeah, data is uh, the basic to, to build something. So in, even for uh, planning, managing or communicating. So it's very important to collect data. So and whatever the data source is, because we have our own sensors, but there are many, many on the market. And we see clearly see by uh, combining data like we do with, uh, with CSENSE, it's very interesting uh, figures that we can get. It's very complementary. And we can think about uh, automatic counting solution, manual counting solutions as well is very interesting, or the, the GPS and whatever. So it's only by working all together that we will get uh, very good uh, and the best information system. So it's just uh, yeah, encouraging because we start to do it, and uh, yeah, it will allow to to build the, the yeah the, the the best network ever. Great, and Sam. Yeah, it's always difficult going last because majority of the points are covered by other people already. But I think my only kind of takeaway really to, 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 to give the people is start thinking about things more holistically, you know, from a wider system perspective, not just mobility in itself. You know, what what does, you know, the, the data mean from a lifestyle perspective? Should we be targeting just the com commuter community or should we be targeting people like kids and schools as, a, as, a, as the behavior change driver um, and moving things forward? So. Think about it on that wider narrative, and as Mark can really touch on, that, that communication narrative, draft that story that resonates with the citizens and the politicians, and that will get, get us very far. So I haven't quite worked out what that looks like yet. If anybody got some great ideas, come and chat. Okay. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. Some really great contributions today. Um, some good insights there. Um, Apologies to the audience that we didn't get to all of your questions, but we will supply all of the questions to our panelists and they can follow up uh, individually um, uh, as, as required. Um, so thank you very much and uh, we'll sign off here. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.